that drowns sorrows, there is an ocean deeper than fear. The tide is rising, rising. There is a current stirring deep inside. It's overflowing from the heart of God. The flood of heaven crushing over us. The tide is rising, rising. Bursting, bursting up from the ground. We feel it now. Bursting, bursting. 
somebody, give them a high five, welcome them here. ahead and be seated. We welcome everyone. We want to welcome all those that are joining us via live stream. We're so glad to have you with us today. We love hearing from you. So thank you for joining with us. It's going to be a great day today. Amen. Well, would you welcome to receive tithes and offerings, Brother Roy Cogsall. Thank you. Well, it's good, good to be back in this church right here. This is my church, my favorite church. So, so thankful to be able to do what we do, but it's good to be home also. So I'm receiving tithes and offerings because I'm going to talk on the subject of sowing. It's a little different than tithing. It's a, a word all through the New Testament, and it's a, akin to a farmer planting seed. And so Jesus was a, a simple teacher, profound but simple. What's the mark of a good teacher? You can understand it. Not that he's so complicated you can't. So a good teacher paints a word picture so you get it. So sowing is beyond you. It's not about you. It's going to cost you something. And it's not about your needs and your wants. And it's putting the things of God first place. Honor simply means high respect, the value that you place on something. And Proverbs said, if you honor the Lord, place it above yourself, what you need, what you want. He said, then with your substance, then your barns will be filled with plenty and your wine presses burst forth with new wine. What does that mean? Well, you're going to be doing good in this arena. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, he said, if you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. Well, how do you know if you sowed bountifully? You'll know. Because you think about it. <laughs> we, we, we did some of that last couple of weeks. I'm thinking about it. I said, Lord, okay, moving stuff around, trying to make it happen. Uh, but I know when I'm inspired to do that, he's got something for me that will launch me out. And so really according to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, where Paul said, see to it that you abound in this grace. Also, he's talking to this church. He's talking to the church at Corinth, but he's bragging on the church of Macedonia, who from their great poverty he said he gave more than they should have. What does that mean? Well, they got into sowing. And then he said he left Titus there to teach them. He said, you abound in all these different things, talking to the church in Corinth, and you're speaking, your prophecy, your gifts, and all the stuff. He said, see to it. Now, that's something you're going to have to do. See to it that you abound into this grace also. So how would you access that grace, the grace of sowing? Sowing. So what is the grace of God? It's his ability and power beyond you and what you can do in yourself that causes you to launch out of this situation that you're in. Now, don't do it just because I said. Go to the verses and let revelation come up in your heart. There is no faith without the Holy Spirit. What do you mean? Faith come by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Well, that Greek word for word there is rhema. It's not logos, which means written word. Rhema means a spoken word. There's more to it. That's what the Holy Spirit does when he puts a little bit of something extra when you're praying. And I've never heard a voice when I say God said. It's usually when I'm in the Spirit, just means I'm more aware of him than, than what's going on. I'm, I'm not floating around in the clouds somewhere not knowing what planet I'm on. I purposely set aside a time to fellowship with him and a complete thought and a verse will come up. That's him speaking to me. And when I act on that, it breaks something open. It opens the supernatural in that area. So you should access that from time to time. Maybe daily, I don't know. I'm not sure I need to. But maybe you're doing better than me. But every now and then you should access that, right? So the best use of your life, because it's going pretty quick. I was 20 yesterday. They say, you don't look like 20. Right. It's good. It went fast. <laughs> the 
The best use of your life is to invest in something that's bigger than you. That would be the kingdom of heaven, wouldn't it? I call it sowing into some 10,000 years from now stuff. And for the youth going on the trip, you know, I, I had my life changed on some of those trips, getting, getting the kids out of their normal atmosphere and getting them away into that. Man, it's life changing. And so I was, uh, love sowing into things that change people's lives. This church, everything about this church, no telling how many marriages have been saved, how many lives didn't end. God only knows. But I'm so thankful to be a part of that. And so everybody has a part in this body. Uh, I sow and give and some other things, but other people give their time and they give their prayers and they clean and they're in the park. It's all vital. No, there's no one piece of your body that's not vital to you. Let, let that one of those pieces break and you'll know. Paul said, actually, you give greater honor to the parts that aren't seen. And he's comparing this to a body. So the purpose of our lives has to be more than problems and pain and survival and struggles. When we sow in spite of our current circumstances, we actually begin to break that cycle of lack, scarcity, and hopelessness and enter into the grace of God in this area of our lives. And actually, 2 Corinthians 9, he said that you would abound into every good work and all grace, not just money grace, not just prosperity grace, whatever we're talking about here. All grace would abound unto you because the money is attached to your heart. And God's about the heart. So when you put him above things, you're setting your heart on him. That allows him to come down and do some things that you couldn't have done on your own. And I'm saying you, sh you should do natural things, right? But, you know, sometimes sowing and get you a lot further than saving. I can attest to that. I'll keep talking. So this morning, bring your tithes and offerings, and remember who you're giving to. It says that Jesus receives our tithes and offerings in heaven because he's our great high priest. So he takes our offerings and presents them to God. And so it's a big deal. It's a big deal to you, and it's a big deal to him. And he's always trying to get you to do this to add to you, never to take away from you. So it's never about subtraction. It's always about multiplication. So, sow with purpose, sow in faith, and know that God is faithful to do what he said. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we bring our tithes and offerings, and just thank you to, just to give back part of what you've provided for us, Father. We thank you, Father, for your grace on our lives, on our family, on our vocations, on our businesses, on our mind, physical body, Father. Thank you. For every good thing, every good and perfect gift comes down from you, Father. There's no verbalness nor even a shadow of that change. And so we honor you. We put you first. We lift you up. With these offerings are gifts this morning. And we say thank you. We ask you, Father, to move in this service. That your will be done here as it is in heaven. That everything in everybody's lives personally, Father, that you would answer the need this morning. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hallelujah. Come on and give him thanks. Ah, uh, we magnify your name, Jesus. We thank you for your power and we thank you for your presence. We thank you for the anointing of the Holy Ghost that removes every burden and destroys every yoke of bondage. And we thank you for this word that's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And we ask you to turn on the light of revelation that we'll see it clearer and brighter than we've ever seen it before. And we give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. And everyone that agree with that said amen. 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 Come on, give him another shout of praise. Oh, yeah. Well, you can go ahead and be seated. Oh, thank God for his presence. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 and verse 17. We've been talking about uh, the last few Sundays reigning in life the way he intended us to live. Verse 17 of Romans 5 says, For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, talking about Adam, when he, he committed high treason in the garden and bowed his knee to the devil, he said, Much more those who receive the abundance of grace, that's me, and of the gift of righteousness, anybody in here receiving the gift of righteousness, will reign in life, talking about this life, through the one Jesus Christ. Now, in many cases, it's difficult for believers to just fully accept this. I mean, we do say amen when we hear it, but this free gift, unearned, unmerited favor, it's not something that you work for or you do good works to achieve or you get holy enough to get there. And it seems almost too good to be true, but it is true. But most Christians still live based on an achievement system. And so the world system is built on these two pillars, self-effort and diligence. And we've been taught to focus on achieving, you know, relying on our own self efforts. The more you do, the harder you work, the more hours you put in, the more success you will achieve. And we are driven to do, 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 forgetting that Christianity is actually done, done, done. <laughs> Amen. Now, I like the old Hoyt Axton song. Work your fingers to the bone. What do you get? Bony fingers. A lot of people say, well, if you just re really work hard. Do you know the hardest working people on earth are the poorest people on earth? It's not just hard work. Amen. And when it comes to, to what belongs to us in Jesus, it's none of our work. It was all his work. Amen. But, you know, we, uh, we, we say, well, you have to pay the price. After all, no pain, no game. And what many believers do is they take the system of the world and apply that to their Christian life. And they try to deserve God's favor and blessing instead of depending on on God's grace for his favor and blessing to flow into our lives. So uh, God's way is not for us to be blessed on our own efforts. You, you cannot earn God's blessing by your performance. God's blessings are based entirely 100% on grace alone. You, you can't live holy enough to deserve it. You know, you could, you, if you ever thought about this, you could be an atheist and never steal or cuss or, you know, run with the world. And uh, you could be sweet and kind and treat everybody with respect and be generous and, and loving, you know, to people. Uh, put others first, never say a harsh word. And still you wouldn't be holy. Because that only comes from the blood of Jesus. You know, you, you, you have to receive him and receive what he's done for you, his finished work. His blessing over your life is undeserved, unmerited, unearned, and his blessings are based entirely on receiving Jesus and through his finished work you receive. Receive what? The abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness and reigning in this life. So God wants us to stop uh, trying to achieve and just begin to receive it. 
the blessing that Jesus accomplished on the cross, the favor, blessing, healing. When he hung on the cross 2,000 years ago, he cried out with a loud voice, it is finished. And everything we need to reign in life was accomplished on the cross. It is a finished work. He finished it. And the only thing that works is finished work. Stop trying to do what he's already done. Now, in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, uh, it says in verse 10, verse 9 says, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, Jesus said. And then verse 10 says, By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 12, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Verse 14, for by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So verse 10 says once for all. Uh, verse uh, 12 says one sacrifice for sin forever. After that, he sat down. Verse 14 says, one offering forever. Jesus was the first sacrifice by the perfect person to perfect some really imperfect people. There are, there are many believers today who do not believe that they have been perfected forever by the finished work of Jesus. They're still trying to qualify with their self-efforts and trying to get holy enough to receive it. That's many people's uh, blocks in receiving from God, receiving his blessing, receiving healing is because they don't think they deserve it because of something they've done. It's not by your work. You didn't, it's not your blood. Well, how can I be fully assured that all my sins have already been forgiven? Because we just read in Hebrews 10, 12, after Jesus paid the price with his own blood for our sins, he sat down. And Now, look at verse 11. Every priest stands ministering daily, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. That sounds like a lot of Christians. Constantly repeating the same thing. Trying to get holy enough. Stands ministering daily. Repeatedly, it says, can never take away sins. So the work of the priests in the old covenant uh, only covered sin. And it was not once and for all. They kept working. Well, our sins are not covered. Our sins are washed away. They no longer exist. All of them. Psalm 103 says, as far as the east is from the west, he has removed our sins from us. I'm glad it didn't say north to south, because you know, once you go north and you get to the North Pole, and if you keep going, you start going south again. There is a point where that changes. But if you start going east, or you start going west, not one point will all of a sudden you be going east. You just keep going west. You keep going west. When, when Magellan, in the 1500s, when he sailed west, he, he got back to Spain three years later, and if he kept going, he'd still be going west unless he turned around and went the other way. As far as the east is from the west, he's removed. That means your sins are gone. It is over. It is finished. All of them. All of them, it's over and it's finished. Verse 11 says the priest stands daily ministering. And verse 12 says Jesus sat down. You don't sit down till the job's finished. It is finished. Say it is finished. So under the Old Testament, the priest who served in the tabernacle of Moses, they never sat down. And the blood of the, uh, the sacrifices of animals only covered sin. They could never take them away. But Jesus was the Lamb of God, the Bible says, who takes away the sins of the whole world once and for all. So these animal sacrifices only covered temporarily. 
And uh, they're a type of Christ. That's why Jesus is called the scapegoat. And that's why he's called the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. So the priest was always ministering at the altar and never sat down. In the holy place, if you study in the tabernacle of Moses, there is not a single piece of furniture prepared for the priest to sit on. Not a single chair in the holy place. It talks about the altar of incense, the table of showbread, but there are no chairs because the work of the priest was never finished. Only Jesus' work was finished. And not only did Jesus sit down, he sat down, we just read in verse 12 uh, right here, at the right hand of God. And not only did he sit down at the Father's right hand, he made us sit with him. Look at this in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4. But God who is rich in mercy. Ooh, I like that. Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He made us sit to, he did it all. So you don't sit down till the job is finished. Everybody say it is finished. So if it's finished, then we rest. Don't you just love to sit down and rest when you finished a big job? I bet some of you even have a favorite chair. I know when we go visit someone, we don't just sit anywhere. They always say, it doesn't matter where does where, where it so It doesn't matter, just sit anywhere, but that, they don't really mean that. Because, and you can tell where it is. Sometimes there's a little shrine right by on the table. It has a coaster and a phone charger and a snack bowl with M&Ms and pretzels, some kind of carb. And most importantly, the remote. That's where the remote stays. And if it's not there when they walk in the room, they don't even look for it. They look at the table and say, where's the remote? <laughs> the difference between us and him is we sit down because we're tired. He sat down because he was finished. Everybody say it is finished. Now, Hebrews chapter 4 and, and, and verse 1, rest Rest is a really important word. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, the children of Israel. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith with those who heard it. Isn't that something? You could hear the word. Faith comes by hearing. We know that. But you could hear the word. If you don't mix faith with it, it won't do you a bit of good. For we who have believed have entered, do enter that rest. As he said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, his plan was for them to enter in, but they wouldn't receive it. Wow. For he had spoken in a certain place on the se uh, uh, of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Look at verse 6. Since therefore it remains that some entered, uh, that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. Now, they said... We can't enter the land because of the great walled cities and the giants. But this says they didn't enter because of disobedience. They thought it was the walled cities. People think that they can't do something because of some sort of obstacle. That's not the problem. That's not the problem. The problem is you're comparing that obstacle to you instead of comparing that obstacle to your God. And we know it was not the giants and the walled cities that kept them out because the next generation went over those walls and took down those giants. But they never did because they would not 
enter his rest. They wouldn't, they just simply wouldn't believe that he had done it. That is the one thing that keeps most people out. Listen to this in, in a Hebrews chapter 4, uh, 1 through 3 in the message translation. For as long then uh, as that promise of resting in him pulls us on to God's goal for us, we need to be careful that we're not disqualified. This is a warning for us. We received the same promise as those people in the wilderness, but the promise didn't do them a bit of good because they didn't receive the promise with faith. If we believe, though, any believers in here, we'll experience that state of resting, but not if we don't have faith. <laughs> Remember that God said, exasperated, I vowed, they'll never get where they're going, never be able to sit down and rest. God made that vow even though he had finished his part before the foundation of the world. How many of you know he's the one that has a hard part? He did his, the hard part's done. All you have to do is receive it. Look at verse 9. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. We, I think we don't have a strong enough revelation on how powerful that word rest is and what it really means. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his work as God did from his. That, that's saying, stop trying to do works to be holy enough to receive God's healing and God's blessing, like you're going to attain some state of holiness and be good enough, then you'll get your healing. Wow. It's not about your good works. It's about his finished work. For he who has entered his rest has himself ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. We, do, we are supposed to be diligent to enter rest. Lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Look at verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. You got to hold on to your confession. That's faith. Faith must be two places in your heart and in your mouth, or it's not faith. It's not just believing something. It's also saying something. You've got to get my book, Faith Has a Voice. Faith has a voice. For we do not, verse 15, this is such a strong verse. For we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity. That's King James. It's a lot better translation. But was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Jesus was tempted every single way you've ever been tempted. The absolute worst thing that you've ever been tempted to do or maybe and, and maybe did it. He was tempted to do the same thing. I think we missed that some. Well, yeah, but this is bad. He did it. He was tempted the same way you were. But he was without sin. And it's interesting. It says, uh, let us hold fast to our confession. He was tempted the same way as we are. Wow. Jesus was tempted to let go of his confession. One of the strongest temptations you'll ever have is being tempted to let go of your confession. What do you mean? Well, the Bible says, by his stripes you were healed. But there's just this thing in you that wants to say when you, when you don't feel good, I don't feel good. I'm sick. Because there's a lot of benefits that come with it. Oh, sweetheart, you don't need to do anything today. Just, just lay down. And then, he, and then sickness becomes your friend. What a great trick of the enemy that is. And if you're sick, you can stay home from school even. And there's a lot of benefits to being sick. And you just... There's just something in you, even once you learn the word, you just want to say it. How are you doing? 
I wish I could tell you. How the, you know, the bills, the bills come in and things are stacking up and you don't know what you're going to do. And you go, hey, how's everything going? I wish I could tell you how it's going. Because you just are tempted. All hell's broken loose. Horrible. You want to know how it's going? Horrible. That's how it's going. Everything's gone. The kids did this. This has happened. We're late on that. Horrible. That's how it is. What are you doing? Giving in to the temptation to let go of your confession? Because faith must be two places or it's not faith. It has to be in your heart and in your mouth, the Bible says. Ooh, this is good preaching. <laughs> let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Yeah, but how can I... Go boldly to the throne of grace when I've met. How can I come boldly into Jesus' presence and just say, here I am when I've sinned, when I've messed up. I know it was wrong. I've made a mess of everything. I knew I shouldn't have done it. You know, whatever it was, I did it. How can I come boldly? Because it's not based on you. It's not your blood. It was his blood. And he cried out, it is finished. It's based. You come boldly based on him. That's how we receive. We don't deserve. It says unmerited. It says it's unearned. It says it's a free gift. You can't earn it. It's a free gift. Everybody say free gift. So this says, Jesus has become our high priest. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Well, mercy is what you want when you messed up. And how you get it is you come boldly. Here I am again, Lord. And he's right there because he's already paid the price. His finished work. Now, having good works and doing the right thing is important. Listen to this in Matthew 15 uh, or Matthew 5 and verse 16. Jesus said, let your light show sh so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Before men that they may see your moral excellence and your praiseworthy, noble, and good deeds and recognize and honor and, and praise and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now, uh, look at this over in, in Titus. Titus chapter 3. Paul is, uh, is talking to a spiritual son, Titus. Verse 5, it says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, like right, doing right things, but according to his mercy he saved us. Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful, look at this, to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to get you into heaven. Is that what it says? These things are good and profitable to men. Jesus and Paul not only emphasize the importance of good works, but the purpose of them for other people. Jesus said that men may see. Paul said profitable for men. Not, not to make you righteous. But they are important. Now, we, now uh, the reason I'm, I, I'm emphasizing this str so strong is we often hear things like, when, when we get holy enough, I mean, when we reach that certain place, I mean, God's really going to pour his spirit. We're, we're, you know, God will bless us. We'll have revival when we reach some certain place of spirituality. Some holy place. You can never be holier than you are right now. You can't do anything to get any holier than you are right now. 
Yeah, but you don't know what I've done. Well, you evidently don't know what Jesus has done. We do have good works. We're, sup we're supposed to work and live right. God, God's way is to bless you first. Not as a result of your works, as a result of Jesus' finished work. One of my favorite scriptures, you hear it all the time if you're uh, around here. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 10. Paul said, by the grace, the unmerited favor, and the blessing of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not found to be for nothing, fruitless and without effect. In fact, he said, I worked harder than all of the apostles, though it was not really I, but the grace, the unmerited favor, and the blessing of God, which was with me. That was a result uh, 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 of what Jesus did first. And he can make your work easy. Now, this scripture in Ephesians uh, 1, uh, the Ephesians prayer, in verse 16, it says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayer, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Not grow to it, not get holy enough for it, he'll just give it to you. You mean he'll just give it to me? That just sounds too good. I know. That's how he is. He's just too good. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. An inheritance is something you just receive. What is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? Here it is, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. So if, it's, we, if we are the body, which is his body, verse 23, the fullness of him who fills all in all. How many of you know the feet are in, you don't have any feet in your head? Your feet are in the body. He's the head, we're the body, so if the enemy is under his feet, he's under your feet too. And then verse 6 again. And he raised us up together of chapter 2 and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Wow. Verse 10 in the, in, in the Amplified of chapter 2 of Ephesians. For we're God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born, a, born, an, uh, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, he planned beforehand for us, ta taking paths which he prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. It's already finished, all of it. And you're supposed to be living the good life. And if it's hard and heavy, you're not doing it right. It's supposed, Jesus said it's supposed to be light and easy if you're doing it with me. He made you righteous. He prearranged, made ready. He did it. He picked you up and he set you down right in the middle of righteousness. Like you would take a baby at bath time and pick that baby up and sit them in the bath. That baby had nothing to do with it. That was all you. When he made you righteous, he just, the Bible says, he picked you up. And he just sit you down right in the middle of righteousness. As none of your efforts make you righteous. None of them. None of your good works. I don't care how holy, I don't care if you don't do anything bad. You're only righteous by his blood. He picked you up and he put you right in the middle of righteousness. And your, your, your self-efforts will rob you of reigning in life by his grace. You cannot earn salvation. You cannot earn his provision. You cannot earn his healing by your own efforts. Well, I just need to be a better Christian. You're on the wrong road. 
If the greatest miracle, being saved from hell, comes by grace through faith and not by your works, how much more lesser miracles, healing and prosperity and restoration. You just receive it by faith. It's not based on you. It's not your blood that does the work. Jesus accomplished everything on the cross. Our part, he finished his part. <laughs> Our part is to trust his perfect finished work and receive this abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness. That scripture, uh, our text scripture said, will those who receive abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in this life. All you do is receive it by faith. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I pray if there's anyone in here that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, they wouldn't walk out these doors without making a decision for you, and I ask you for that in Jesus' name. Now, just for a moment, while every head's bowed and every eye closed, if you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you can't lay down to sleep at night and know beyond a shadow of a doubt, if you were to die in your sleep tonight that you'd go to heaven, you can know. This is not a hope so salvation. This is a no so salvation. Maybe there's somebody here that said, uh, well, I've served the Lord, but uh, I want to rededicate my life to the Lord. I want to I want to uh, come back to Jesus. We're going to pray that prayer here in just a second, too. That's the second invitation. The third invitation is this. If you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, it is the most powerful thing that will happen to you in this life. It's more important than anything. We're all going to pray a prayer together here in just a moment, but this is just for me right now. If you say, uh, uh, I don't know for sure if I died in my sleep, I'd go to heaven, but I want to, or I want to rededicate my life, uh, just slip your hand up real quick for me so I can see it, and so I can pray for you. Anybody in the room, all right? Anyone else before we all pray together? Anybody else before we all pray together? There might be some joining us online. There might be people in here that should have lifted their hand but didn't. I want you to join with us. As a matter of fact, let's all do it. Let's all lift one hand toward heaven. That's where your help comes from. Let's all say this prayer together. Repeat it after me and mean it with your heart. Father God, I come to you in Jesus' name. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me with your precious blood and make me whole. And I'll follow you all the days of my life in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, come on and give it thanks that heaven's your home.